Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoyed your one on one meetings and had a chance to network over lunch. So now it's time for our fireside chat, and I'm pleased and honored to introduce our guest, Susan Dumay. Uh, Susan is a technical fellow and managing director of Microsoft Research, Microsoft Research East Coast Labs in New England, New York City, and Montreal. Um, she's had an amazing career uh, with Lifetime Achievement Awards from Sig Chi and Sig IR and Athena Lecture Award. She is a member of the Chi Academy, Sig IR Academy, National Academy of Engineering, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and an ACM Fellow. Um, Susan's also a former assistant director of MSR AI and previous was a researcher and manager in Redmond. Um, I've known her for several years. I actually reported up through her uh, for several years in the past and have been lucky to benefit from her guidance and mentorship um, over the past several years. So I'm really excited to have her here with us today. Um, so welcome, Susan. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Neil, and, and welcome, everyone. This is a really fun event. I'm sorry that I we can't be there in, in person. It's so amazing to meet um, all of our fellowship and grant uh, recipients. And I will try to join you tomorrow to, to meet virtually one on one in various ways. But uh, in the meantime, we'll proceed in uh, with a fireside chat just to, so that I can get to, to uh, talk a little bit about my background and perspectives. Thank you, Sue. Um, so I'm going to kick things off, but just for the audience out there, I, I want you to know we want to hear your questions. There is a Q&A uh, window where you can submit questions. So please submit anything you'd like um, for me to ask uh, Sue along the way. Um, but I'll, I'll start off with uh, with um, a little bit. And so um, Sue, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your journey to MSR uh, to this point? Yeah, I, mean, I wish it, it, it was a really simple story, but it's one I think that many of you will encounter moving forward that, uh, you know, you start out with a plan and that plan takes lots of twists and, and turns along the way. So, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I certainly did not aspire to be a technical fellow at Microsoft and a lab director. I aspired to be many other things, but not that. Um, so I grew up in Maine. I was the first in my family to, to go to college. I went to a small liberal arts school named Bates College that was only a few blocks from where my parents lived. And I majored in, in math with the intent of going to law school to study environmental law. Uh, and then the first of many twists happened. It, when I was a junior, I took an independent study course in what was called mathematical psychology. It would be now be called cognitive science. And I was totally fascinated by the possibilities of understanding sort of human intellect, memory, and, and learning with tools from mathematics and mathematical modeling. And so uh, I just decided to switch plans. I did, decided not to go to law school and went to graduate school in um, math, in cognitive science and um, it, with the intent of being a professor after I graduated. But again, there was a bit of a twist. When I graduated, I did interview at many universities um, but Bell Labs was at that time starting the first human computer interaction group in industry. And it seemed like just such a tremendous opportunity and one that I couldn't pass up. So again, I switched gears a little bit, did something uh, a little different and uh, and decided to go into to industrial research with the, the notion that if I didn't like it, I could leave after a couple of years. And that was almost 40 years ago. So you can say that I uh, I got along with it pretty well. Uh, and one of the things I worked on at, at Bell Labs that you might have heard of is something called a latent semantic indexing, which was a very early method for uh, word in, embedding. And you know, it was a very simple linear factorization model, very much like eigen analysis, trained on, you know, by today's standards, minuscule amounts of data, hundreds of abstracts, and a you know, hundred parameters or so. Uh, but it was really successful in, in early information retrieval systems. Uh, it even passed the test of English as a foreign language. And then a, a little more than 20 years ago, I left uh, Bell Labs and, and joined Microsoft Research. And since I've been at Microsoft Research, I've, I've worked on many different projects. Re at the intersection, as Neil mentioned at the beginning, of human-computer interaction, uh, information retrieval, and, and AI. A few of, let me just mention briefly a few of my favorite things at, at Microsoft. Um, I worked the very first intern I worked with was a, a guy named Maran Sahami, who's a professor now at Stanford, 
And we, along with David Heckerman and Eric Corbett, built, uh, I think, the world's first spam filter. It's uh, maybe one of the, the most widely used examples of AI. It's been operational for over 20 years now. Um, I also worked on something called Stuff I've Seen, which was a system that we created to help people find information regardless of where they have seen it or encountered it. And then finally, you know, in the recent years, I've worked a lot on personalization in, in web search with the basic idea being that um, it, one size doesn't fit all. What's relevant to a searcher's query, even if Neil and I issue the same query, will depend a lot on who we are, what we've done in the past, where we are, when it is, and, and so on. So a lot of my work has been at this intersection of uh, information systems and uh, human computer interaction in, in various ways. So uh, now I spend much more of my time doing technical leadership and management and less of my time doing my own research, but I'm I'm enjoying the latter in, in many ways. Awesome, thank you. It's such a, been such a, um... It's a cool journey to hear about, and actually, I didn't I didn't know about your uh, that you were the first in your family to go to college, or that you're from Maine. And I've talked to you so many times, and <laughs> I've heard those bits. Um, and so uh, now you're you you were in Redmond before, but you're actually back on the East Coast now. Um, I guess you've been directing those labs for about a year now. Um, and uh, I'd just love to. Um, for you to share a little bit about what the East Coast labs are like and if there's any sort of unique projects that would be uh, interesting for for the students we have here. Yeah, so it, it's uh, it's been an interesting new role. I, I took it on at the end of January and uh, the first month was probably one of the most amazing times I've had at Microsoft, just traveling uh, between the three labs in New England Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, New York City, and, and Montreal. Uh, and then, you know, the, the pandemic hit, as uh, well as a variety of other things. And so we've been working under somewhat different circumstances than I had imagined. But all in all, it's been a, an amazing opportunity for me to learn and, and grow. So as Neil said, I managed three labs. The, they were all founded at, at somewhat different times. And so it's been fun to learn about uh, the different cultures and the mix of topical foci in the labs. The, the lab in New England, which is in, in Cambridge, started in 2008. The New York City lab started in 2012. And the Montreal lab started just three years ago in, in 2017. Uh, and as I mentioned, they all have somewhat different cultures and uh, mixes of projects and, and people. What they all share, however, and it's something that really resonates with me, is that they're all really interdisciplinary. And so they bring together people who, you know, people in perspectives from computer science, from economics, social sciences, and recently some biological sciences, with, like all the other Microsoft labs, the intent of carrying out world-class interdisciplinary research um, that will impact Microsoft, the academic community, and, and society as, as a whole. And I think uh, one of the reasons that I love the interdisciplinary perspective is first of all that it resonates with me in, in my background, but I think more importantly, if you look at the problems that, that we as computer uh, scientists are trying to solve and social scientists, many of the pressing problems, whether it's health care, climate change, and, and so on, are not just computer science problems. It's not enough to just uh, build a great algorithm. You know, you really need to understand the socio-technical context in which something is deployed and uh, really understand the coevolution of, we'll say, work practices and, and systems. And so, you know, even for something as seemingly simple as web search, which I've done a lot of work on, it's not enough to have a great algorithm for matching a query to a billion pages. You know, that that's an amazing technical challenge. People, you need to solve it. I, I don't want to dismiss the, uh, the importance of being able to do that, but you also need to be able to help people articulate what they're looking for, make sense of results. Um, at a pragmatic level, you need to deal with a constant barrage of adversaries of all kinds. And so it's really pulling all these pieces together that I find really interesting. And the, you know, the three labs have research um, researchers and, and projects in machine learning, broadly speaking, economics, and computational social sciences. And I find 
that mix of uh, perspectives, the interactions that people have, you know, really, really uh, critical. Let me just mention three areas. So one area is in fate or fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics. And that's clearly a case where it's not just about good algorithms, but we really need to understand, uh, you know, things like responsible use um, of AI techniques, bias and, and fairness. There's also a lot of work in economics and computation around causal modeling and market design, things like that. And then there's a, a ton of different work in uh, machine learning of, of all kinds, looking at deep learning in Montreal, um, real world applications of reinforcement learning in New York, and things like um, auto ML, sort of automatically uh, tuning machine learning systems in, in New England. So it's a really interesting mix. Um, and I think together, those those different um, backgrounds and, and skills really come together uh, much better than than they they would uh, as just the sum of the parts. So it's a really a uh, fun mix of of different perspectives on real problems. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, you know all all the people I talked to from the, the East Coast Labs, the diversity of perspectives that they bring. Um, yeah, so you mentioned uh, you know basically in month kind of two in this new role. The pandemic hit, and I'm I'm curious how how has that changed things, and how have you managed? You know, already you had three separate labs; they're yes. very interdisciplinary. How have you managed to, um, and how has that evolved um, during the situation where we all have been working from home and people still um, are needing to talk and collaborate? How's that? How's that gone down? Well, it, it, I think it, I'll I'll reflect on what's happened locally in the the three labs that that I manage. But more generally, I think Microsoft as a whole has really embraced uh, this as an opportunity for us as a, a company to understand the, the future of remote work, to rethink work practices. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation and surveys going on in, in the, the company. Jamie Tevan and, and her team in, um, in experiences and, and devices organization is leading a, an effort to really just understand this, what works well, what doesn't work well. And I think we're learning, a, you know, a, a lot. It, it's quite interesting that remote work is something that, that people were interested in doing for many years. And, you know, it's just now in this crisis where we're starting to see telemedicine actually take hold, where people are uh, doing more meetings conferences even in, in ways that are much more ecologically um, sound. So I think as a company, Microsoft has really tried to embrace this, learn what works well and then what doesn't work well. As um, you know, as a, a new lab director, it was really uh, you know quite interesting when, when COVID hit and we were all starting to work from home. There were also, I was living in Boston at the time, a lot of civil uh, and political unrest and challenges. There were natural disasters like hurricanes and fires. Um, and to make things more interesting, two of the three labs moved. So the New York and Montreal labs moved to new buildings in the middle of this. Um, and uh, I, I did notice some interesting um, differences, I'd, I'd say. Um, there are some things that we clearly miss in, in going all virtual and there are some things that are, are better. So the first month I was remote in uh, in the New England versus being in Redmond, I felt um, a little bit disenfranchised as a meeting attendee because people weren't paying attention to somebody who was remote. And I missed all of the pre and post meeting conversations. But that all changed when meetings went virtual. And I think in many ways we've developed new muscles around uh, being more inclusive and uh, of people in lots of different locations in, in meetings. So that's a huge plus. On the negative side, I think we've sort of settled for the lowest common denominator. So we don't have these great pre and post meeting conversations, uh, informal hallway conversations, brainstorming and, and so on to germinate new ideas are, are more difficult. Um, and you know, we need to build social capital in, in ways that are, are challenging. We, we did hold, I think, a very successful offsite across the, the labs, but it, I also realized at that time that 20% of our people were new since the pandemic had started. Oh. And so we've been doing a, a lot to try to make sure that, that people who have started since then understand a little bit about the, you know, the culture, the people, and, and so on. So we're learning a lot. We're trying a lot of new things. 
Um, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll come out of it better in, in many ways, embracing a variety of different ways to, to interact. But it, it, it has been a great learning experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I actually went remote a few months before the pandemic as well. And so I definitely noticed that transition from being the odd person out to yeah. everyone being on equal foot. Yeah, but it's not the highest ground, right? It was yeah, <laughs> uh, it's not, but it's definitely afforded us some opportunities and amongst the challenges. And um, I think that's been you know, really interesting. Um, I see a question here from the audience um, kind of uh, you mentioned, um, you know, some of the, the ethical and, and societal challenges we've had this year. And so um, this question from the audience is, um, I've seen a lot of talks and presentations about ethical AI, but what I'm not seeing is how it changes the technology of AI. Could you speak about that and how algorithms and models are designed differently to deal with ethics challenges? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a really broad question. There are, you know, a, a ton of, of different uh, challenges in, in building models. They, you know, they can, they can exacerbate uh, some of the biases that exist in, in the, um, in the physical world, um, or they can help mitigate them depending on how you, you, they're used. Let me just talk about um, you know, some of the, the many things that the, the group on fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics has done. It's a group actually that spans uh, the New York City lab, the New England lab, Montreal, some folks in, in Redmond. It's a you know, very uh, well-known group. And if you just look up FATE at uh, Microsoft Research, you'll, you can check in uh, and, and hear more about things. Um, but, you know, if you look at um, one of the things that the group has worked on is a responsible AI standard, which is really to help teams in developing and deploying AI technologies in a responsible manner. And uh, there are, you learn by, by doing, um, there's a, a central working group called Ether that really looks at a lot of the, the challenges in um, sensitive uses, in fairness, in, in model interpretability, and, uh, and and so on, and tries to build build tools to help people understand when there are biases, to help understand um, how to do fairer learning algorithms, how to. So there's you know a new set of tools that are being deployed. Uh, Miro Dudik is in, involved in it, and from our New York lab called FairLearn, that really tries to allow you to. Um, to optimize many objectives, including some notions of fairness. There's work that was done by Rich Caruana and many others in uh, Redmond on uh, what's it called, interpret ML, that takes um, sort of a, a, a black box approach to deep learned models, which are, are pretty common and tries to provide some interpretable uh, representations of those. So I think what people are trying to do a lot is um, is understand where there are challenges and then to try to develop tools to you know to, to mitigate those beyond that there's a, been work on uh, data sheets for data sets trying to tell people it's almost like the labels you get on uh, on products telling them how the data was collected how it can be generalized and, and so on so i think people are really um understanding some of the challenges but not just writing papers about it which they they do a lot but really looking at how we can build tools in the standard machine learning pipelines to help uh, mitigate some of these, these challenges. One area that I think is especially interesting and, and prevalent is some of the challenges when you try to generate language in an open world. And so there's a lot of work on ongoing right now in uh, you know, generating language in, in ways that go well beyond some of the constrained chatbot-like situations. Thanks. Um so um, taking another question from uh, the audience. Um, so uh, as a student, it seems like research is constantly changing in the deep learning age. Yeah. Uh, as a recipient of the Test of Time Award, what is your opinion on the type of research which will carry on the next decade um, or will be distinguished more from more than just a trend? Uh, that, that's really interesting. I was. It, as I as you were talking uh, through that question, Neil, I kept thinking like which test of time awards did I win? And I, I've won several. <laughs> um, they I think they they are of uh, you know two classes. One tend to be 
sort of new ideas to the work on stuff I've seen, won a test of, of time award, award, some of the work on personalization, then they opened up whole new areas. Um, and then sometimes they're just good algorithmic, um, you know, innovations. It's, I think, let me just talk a little bit about deep learning. You know, deep learning now is, is the question alludes to is really moving at such a breakneck pace. Um, it, and that's especially true in cases where there are existing data sets and leaderboards and everybody is trying to climb to the top of the leaderboard. And, you know, much as I, I think it does help push some technologies forward, I think simply trying to climb to the top of the leaderboard with whatever combinations of tools and tricks come to your mind is not a way to have lasting impact it, it, you know because in partly in part because we may not understand why something works uh, if you try enough alternatives you're going to capture some oddity of the data that just doesn't generalize well to other things and so um, they are uh, leaderboards are useful for some things but I don't think they're useful uh, necessarily to build algorithms and understanding that will generalize well, um, you know, moving forward. And if you if you look at the NeurIPS test of time awards, many of them are are, um, are some of the more theoretical things that that, you know, re really are relevant. Last year that, you know, one was from uh, uh, Lin Zhao from Microsoft on um, optimization and that many of those ideas still ring, ring true today. It'll be interesting 10 years from now what of the deep learning revolution we see winning test of time awards are still being relevant, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about in our group about how how benchmarks have moved, um, you know, the state of the art for, but how we need to move beyond benchmarks. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's really an, an insightful thought is, is that you can really overfit to those. Um, and so I do, I agree. I think that, I think we're gonna need to kind of get away from a little bit of that. Um, you know, one of the things about benchmarks too, is that somebody has defined the problem for you. And we don't even know what sample space those problems are chosen over, but somebody has defined a problem for you. They've taken data, they've collected data, they've cleaned that data. And so a lot of the real world challenges in, uh, you know, building models, figuring out, uh, or building you know end-to-end -end systems are just taken away and you're focusing on this one component of um, optimizing uh, you know the metric again that's been decided on and I, I benchmarks are now starting to look um, across many tasks and I think that adds to robustness but uh, yeah I think there are some very interesting challenges in focusing just on benchmarks um, yeah I agree I'm, I'm curious actually beyond beyond those beyond the benchmarks are there Kind of what what are your what are your thoughts on sort of what are the biggest challenges and opportunities moving forward in in AI? Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I guess the first thing to to acknowledge is that let me let me just talk about sort of the le deep learning revolution in the last decade. Um, you know, it's hard to realize sometimes that it's ten years ago. I think that some of the early work on um, you know, that George Dahl, Jeff Hinton, and, and folks at MSR actually did on deep acoustic modeling for uh, speech recognition. It's only 10 years ago. And if you look at some of the amazing capabilities that we have now, whether it's uh, speech recognition on phones and intelligent assistance, whether it's image recognition and captioning, whether it's uh, natural language understanding and machine translation, uh, those all come from advances that have happened in the, the last decade. And it's, uh, and we should appreciate that. They do enable things that I didn't think were possible a decade ago. If you had told me I could turn on Teams, speak in real time in one language and have it translated to someone in a, a different language in real time, I would never have believed it. I would never have believed that I could pick up my phone and talk to it. I have grandchildren who just think that's the way the world works. You know, they have no idea how hard that is. And so there are really amazing capabilities. But I think um, one of the things we're going to have to do uh, moving forward is to um, these systems are biased, as we just talked about in many ways. They're very fragile. 
they have narrow wedges of competency that are driven sometimes by available uh, test collections. And they tend to do a really good job of memorizing, but not generalizing. So what I think what we're going to see more and more is systems that are more robust uh, to changes in, in distribution and, and unknowns in the open world. Uh, I think we'll develop um, models that are grounded in the real world and, and level leverage priors prior knowledge rather than just the fire hose of uh, of bottom up data. So in you know in the context of language, we'll go from strings to things, sort of entities and and relations. Um, and I, I think we will have to as we move forward rely less on brute force and, and think much more about sample efficiency and in learning as well as serving models cost effectively. So I think the models will just really be more of a mix of purely inductive learning and then some priors or structures that are based on a knowledge of the real world that I think will make things much uh, less brittle and um, and and more and yeah, much less brittle and more generalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Uh, I agree. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Um, so, um, you know, with uh, our audience here, these are all all um, people starting out in their careers. Um, and and um, I was just wondering if you could kind of just share some final re reflections about kind of the the key moments and successes in your career and some advice for for our audience who's just um, really at the beginning of 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 their their um, trajectory and starting to to blossom. Yeah, I had to. Um, we'll all experience different uh, ups and, and downs, but let, let me just talk about, I think, three level high level principles that that stand out to me um, when I think uh, about my career and they all begin with P. So one is have a purpose, uh, be passionate about what you do and persevere. So when I talk about having a purpose, um, I mean, you know, be purposeful in, in setting a direction and, and goals. Have a point of view that's just going to help you prioritize. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can can't divert from it. I told you early on that there are lots of times when new opportunities have arisen and I've uh, seized that that opportunity. Uh, but I think you should have a point of view and a purpose as you you start out in, in your research. Uh, you know, be passionate about what you do. Different people are motivated in, in different ways. Some people want to have really broad societal impact. I like to fix things that really annoy me. Uh, and so that, that's how I motivate a lot of my work. But what motivates you may be very, very different. But have a passion because we all work really hard. We all spend many hours on this and um, you need to, to do it for a, a reason that that speaks to you. And perhaps the, the most important one is persevere. You have to be persistent in, in your pursuits. Uh, you know, don't give up after the first failure. I've had way more failures than successes. Uh, you learn from the failures. Take time to celebrate when you have successes. Um, you know, you'll also need a, a good dose of things like teamwork and communication and, and respect for others. But I think, um, you know, really, maybe the biggest thing is don't wait for uh, problems to find you. Uh, go out there, explore, and find things that speak to your your passions. Learn and, and seize opportunities. Uh, and most of all, have a lot of fun doing it. Thanks. Yeah, um, I love the way you put that. I've always kind of tried to think about it as, um, you know, if you're on a boat, you need you want to run your motor and you want to you know, have your rudder pointed in a direction yeah. um, and go in that direction, but feel free to change where your rudder is pointed at any point. <laughs> um, yeah. But don't stay, don't stay still. That's right. Um, and so, yeah. yeah um, I like the boat analogy. I We owned a boat for, a, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Boats move more slowly than people sometimes, right? <laughs> but <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, well, uh, we're really right about at time here. Um, so I just wanted to to thank you, um, Sue, for for joining us today and chatting um, chatting with uh, the PhD uh, summit um, attendees. I really appreciate um, your time, and it's been really fun um, uh, hearing from you and, and learning from you. Uh, so thanks again uh, for joining us. Um, 
And uh, just uh, before we close, I wanted to remind people that we have a 15 minute break um, and we'll be starting at 1245 with our panel. Um, so thank you, Sue. Thanks, Neil. And uh, all of the folks at the PhD Summit, I hope to, to be able to talk to some of you in, in person to, tomorrow. So save some of the questions that were in the chat that I didn't get to. Thanks again, Neil. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone, for, uh, for attending. And uh, we'll see you back in 15 minutes for the, the panel. Okay, bye.